This is part two of Our Haunted Planet. A book by John Akeel. Please listen with an open mind before YouTube deletes it. Remember that, knowledge is power, so don't let anyone tell you how to think. Chapter 3. IT's a nice place to visit but. Soon after he became president of the United Arab Republic, the late Colonel Abdel Nasser ordered a giant 80-foot statue moved from the desert to a park in Cairo. The statue had been standing foot uncounted centuries near the famous Step Pyramid. A battery of engineers and workmen descended on it, equipped with bull tiers, tractors and monstrous cranes. They struggled with the project for weeks, first perplexed, then annoyed, and finally humiliated by the discovery that modern technology simply could not budge the man-moth piece of stone. This raised the even more troublesome question, how had the ancient Egyptians moved the statue into place to begin with? Archaeologists have been arguing for years about the methods employed by the ancient stone masons. Some quite moronic theories have not only been suggested but have been widely accepted as the answer. These theories are, as usual, taught to school children. The mystery is regarded as solved. Nobody asks questions. There are over 90 pyramids in Egypt alone. There are dozens of others all over the world, the largest of all is located deep in China. Most of the Egyptian pyramids were once used as the burial places for pharaohs, but the Great Pyramid at Giza was never employed for this purpose, and no one has an inkling why it was built. Some of the gigantic stones in these structures and in the Great Temple spotted, around Egypt were apparently taken from quarries hundreds of miles away. The popular archaeological theory is that these stones were floated up the Nile on rafts and then moved into place on wooden rollers. Since some of these blocks weigh as much as five tons, this means that in order to float them, the Egyptians would have had to build huge rafts capable of displacing over five tons of water. Otherwise, they would just sink to the bottom with their load. The Egyptians didn't amount to much when it came to building ships. No evidence of these super rafts has ever turned up. There are other flaws in these theories. We are told that hundreds of thousands of slaves were pressed into pyramid building during certain seasons of each year. This leads us to the problem of logistics. It would take a complex organization to feed these hundreds of thousands daily and administer to their needs. Various modern engineers and experts have applied their slide rules to the problem, and the most liberal estimate of the time required to construct the Great Pyramid is 600 years. Strangely, Although the ancient Egyptians left propulsive records of everything else, no one has ever turned up even a single piece of papyrus describing the planning or building of these massive monuments. The stones were cut and dressed with such perfection that a piece of paper cannot be inserted between them. Obviously those early stonemasons were superb craftsmen, and obviously there were a lot of them in order to undertake and complete such enormous tasks. When there is a mystery which can't be logically explained by science, cults develop which create explanations of their own. Our Atlantophiles naturally agree that the Egyptians didn't build the pyramids at all. Our UFO buffs claim they were built by the wonderful space people. Morris K. Jessup, an astrophysicist and an early student of ufology, reviewed the question and suggested, levitation is the only feasible answer. I believe that lifting machine was a spaceship, probably of vast proportions that it brought colonists to various parts of the earth, probably from other terrestrial areas, that it supplied the heavy lift power for erecting great stone works, and that it was suddenly destroyed or taken away. Such a hypothesis would underwrite the entire movements of stone over which archaeologists and engineers have pondered. This presents us with a splendid contradiction. If some super society in the sky had the technology to build a spaceship of vast proportions and fly it all the way to our humble planet, why would they have the need to play around with stone blocks? If they wanted to leave behind evidence of their visit, they did a poor job of it, for we never have figured out the real meaning of these monoliths. Couldn't they have engraved a nice little message for us inside the Great Pyramid, explaining the whole thing in 75 languages? The only carvings found inside the Great Pyramid are a few little scratching in the roof of the upper chamber which archaeologists regard as stonemason marks. Similar marks have been found in other structures. Maybe they are just the ancient equivalent of Kiroi was here. For centuries the spirit mediums and the percipients who have chatted with ghostly Atlanteans have told us that the Great Pyramid really contains a hidden chamber which is crammed with goodies that will explain everything to us when the proper time comes. 
Not wishing to be left out, many flying saucer contactees have repeated the same promise. An anthropologist named George Hunt Williamson wrote in the early 1950s, the builders of the Great Pyramid buried one of their great spaceships near the structure. It will be revealed, no doubt within a comparatively short time, that there are many secret chambers within the Great Pyramid and that its true entrance lies under the silent object that is like a lion and yet like a man, the Sphinx. It will not remain silent much longer. On February 9, 1960, a fertilizer salesman named Reinhold Schmidt was picked up by a flying saucer and flown to Egypt, AC according to his pamphlet. Edge of Tomorrow The friendly space people conducted him on a tour of those hidden chambers where he saw, among other things, the true cross on which Christ had died. He was also shown 32 tablets of a heavy quality paper, rather dark in color, Imagine my surprise when I found the events of the past, present, and future there described in modem day English, in black ink, and written in beautiful longhand. These records indicated, Schmidt claimed. The end of this present Earth cycle will be 1998, so after the endless discussions of the hidden chambers in the pyramid, we anally had a genuine eyewitness who had been there and seen them. Unless, of course, Schmidt's adventure was just another variation of the classical visits to the underground fairy palaces of yesteryear. Science took over. In 1969 a group of American scientists beaded by Dr. Luis W. Alvarez traveled to Egypt and set up expensive cosmic greater than ray detectors around the Great Pyramid. Their theory was that any cosmic rays penetrating the pyramid and passing through hidden chambers would be recorded as moving slightly faster than ray particles traveling through solid stone. They addled with their gadgets for months and did get some very eccentric readings at first. But one Neville Spearman Limited, London. Finally, in the February 6, 1970 issue of Science, Dr. Alvarez glumly announced that no hidden chambers had been detected with his sophisticated apparatus. The cultists all nudged each other and winked knowingly. Obviously it was all a cover-up. Part of the great conspiracy to keep the truth from the public, Men have been scratching their heads over the Great Pyramid for at least 4,000 years. It has never really been dated, and it could be considerably older. Whoever built it was so clever that countless efforts to find an entrance met with failure for thousands of years. Finally, in AD 820 the Caliph A1 Maman launched a full-scale attack on the structure, expecting to find it filled with treasure. His men chipped away at it heating the stones with fires and then cooling them suddenly by pouring vinegar over them. Slowly the stones cracked and they worked their way into the pyramid until they came upon a passageway. It was completely empty. They found a larger passageway, now known as the Great Gallery, which leads upwards to two small chambers. The lower chamber's entrance is so small a man must enter on his hands and knees. The upper chamber contains nothing but a crude stone tub which really doesn't resemble the elaborately designed sarcophagi used by the ancient Egyptians to entomb deceased royalty. The total absence of artifacts and hieroglyphics have given archaeologists plenty to speculate over. Some have suggested that the pyramid was used as a kind of grain elevator and that wheat was measured out in that tub. Others have tried to find astronomical significance to it. In the mid-19th century the pseudoscience of pyramidology was boom. A writer named John Taylor published a book in which he concluded that the whole purpose of the structure was to preserve indent Egyptian measurements. He was followed by an astronomer, Charles Piazzi Smith, who extended this notion to include prophecies of the past and future. He measured every inch of the pyramid, inside and out, and every angle. In 1864 Smith published a 600-page book expounding his theories, and it caused uproar in archaeological circles for years afterwards. A small but devoted cult still exists, still trying to validate his now thoroughly discredited concepts. Most of the literature on Lost Atlantis also discusses Smith and pyramidology. The UFO cults also have their pyramidologists. Just as the pyramids is a cornerstone in human history, they also serve as key evidence to many cults with widely diversified causes. Aside from the few major population centers, indent Egypt was a mud hut culture. Then as now the masses lived undernourished lives in grinding poverty. Technical skills were rare. Yet somehow they managed to quarry those gigantic stones, transport them, and put them into place with geometric precision. 
We know that the Egyptians did build the 90-odd pyramids, the village of Meroe on the upper Nile contains dozens of pyramids alone, plus numerous great temples and tombs which are still standing. But why did they build the Great Pyramid? The Plain of Jars in Laos has been frequently mentioned in the war dispatches from Indochina. Did you ever wonder how it got its name? The answer is obvious, it is strewn with jars, huge stone jars. Some of them are over six feet high. Some are so large they can hold six men. There are over a thousand of these peculiar artifacts scattered around a high plateau surrounded by mountains. They were apparently carved out of limestone and granite boulders, and they've been there forever. No one seems to know who carved them, when and why. Why would anyone bother to spend weeks carving a giant stone jar in such a remote place? Mysterious stonemasons have left the fruits of their labors all over our haunted planet. Many of these fruits make no sense at all. In Costa Rica giant stone balls have been found deep in the jungles. Some of these are as big as 8 feet in diameter and weigh more than 16 tons. They are amazingly round and smooth. Scores of smaller ones, some only a few inches in diameter, have also been found. Scientists have been unable to come up with an explanation for their purpose, although they are obviously man-made. Similar stones have been found in Mexico and Guatemala. One thing the scientists agree on is that the spheres must have been very important to the communities of people that made them, Science Digest observed in June 1967. Using the tools they had, it must have taken many years to make just one ball, even with many men working on it. Like the jars of Laos, these balls are made of granite and limestone. The United States is covered with strange artifacts and stone ruins of unknown origin. Every state boasts of several mysterious sites. In West Virginia there are the remains of huge circular stone structures apparently predating the Indians. In many states there are ruins which archaeologists have muttered about being of Roman origin. Some of these sites have become minor local tourist attractions, others are marked only by brief highway signs. A random few, such as Mystery Hill in North Salem, New Hampshire, have attained some celebrity. Mystery Hill features several chambers, or tombs, topped by a gigantic sacrificial table weighing over four tons. It is supported on stone legs and is carefully grooved. In 1969 the New England Antiquities Research Association conducted carbon-14 tests to around the site and concluded that it was probably built around 1000 BC. Recent investigations have demonstrated that some of the huge stones on Mystery Hill are carefully aligned with certain stars. Each year the sun sets directly over the winter solstice monolith on the first day of winter, December 21st, when viewed from the center of the eight, the sacrificial table. The Delaware Indians have a tradition that a race of giants once inhabited the region east of the Mississippi, living in enormous cities and fortifications. There are innumerable references to giants in other Indian lore and in ancient literature all over the world, including, of course, the famous there were giants in the earth in those days biblical statement, Genesis 6-4. South American Indians also have many legends about giants and their special civilization. Most of the tales, no matter what the source, assert that the giants were unfriendly and even hostile to normal men. Bones of giants, who must have been 8 to 12 feet tall, have been found in the mounds of Minnesota and several other places. So it is entirely possible that a race of giants did exist in earlier times, and some of these huge stone constructions may have seen their handiwork. Unfortunately, science doesn't believe in giants, so all this evidence has been ignored. There is also considerable evidence that Christopher Columbus was a rather late arrival to the New World. He was probably preceded by the Vikings and maybe even the ancient Phoenicians. Chinese artifacts have been found in Mexico and California, so perhaps even the Chinese beat Chris by several centuries. A knight from the Orkney Islands left a carving in Massachusetts in the 14th century. Near Hevener, Oklahoma, there is a stone 12 feet high, 10 feet wide, and 16 inches thick, covered with ancient Scandinavian runic symbols. It was discovered by Choctaw Indians in 1830, and archaeologists have been arguing about it ever since. Several other runestones have been found, the two organic materials contains radioactivity which deteriorates at a known rate. 
The carbon-14 test is a universally accepted method for measuring such deterioration and determining the age of the material. The test does not work on inorganic substances such as stone, of course. Most famous being the Kensington Stone, found by a farmer near Kensington, Minnesota, at the turn of the century. Two more runestones have been found in Oklahoma in recent years. The last one was discovered by two schoolboys near Pateau, Oklahoma, in September of 1967. As usual, the archaeologists are sharply divided over the validity of these discoveries. One group cries hoax even though it would require an expert archaeologist and linguist to perpetrate such a hoax. Others, such as Frederick Pohl, a noted Norse scholar, seem to think these stones may be authentic. Eight fifty years before Columbus conned Queen Isabella into financing his expedition, someone drew up a rough map of North America. A copy of this map was discovered by Lawrence Whitten, a rare book dealer from New Haven, Connecticut, in 1957. It is now part of the rare document collection in the Beinecke Library of Yale University and is known as the Yale Vinland map. Scientific investigators have dated it at AD 1440, and as usual, the leading experts have been arguing about it ever since. Some have branded it an out-and-out -out hoax, while others regarded it as further evidence that the Vikings were frequent visitors to the New World. More substantial evidence has been found in the form of ruins of a Viking longhouse on the Umgava Peninsula in northern Canada. A team from Laval University has dated it between the 11th and 12th centuries. Numerous other ruins and artifacts have been found all over North America. For example, two remarkably similar axes, both apparently of medieval European origin, have been discovered in Beardmore, Ontario, and Rocky Nook P. O. Ent. Massachusetts. Archaeologists from the Smithsonian Institution uncovered a small slab of stone covered with ciphers in 1885 near Bat Creek, Tennessee. They decided it was probably the work of Cherokee Indians, but modern specialists such as Dr. Joseph B. Mahan of the Museum of Arts and Crafts at Columbus, Georgia, have taken a second look at it and disputed the old Indian theory. Dr. Mahan knows Cherokee and he persuaded the Smithsonian to re-examine the Bat Creek stone. You simply can't ignore evidence, Dr. Mahan stated, just because it doesn't fit current theory. A similar stone was found by Manfred Metcalf at Fort Benning, Georgia, in 1968. Metcalf was looking for stones to build a barbecue grill in his backyard when he unearthed the stone. It is nine inches square and covered with triangles, circles, and straight and wavy lines. He passed it on to Dr. Mahan, who thought the markings appeared to be characteristically Mediterranean. Another scientist, Dr. Cyrus H. Gordon, chairman of Mediterranean Studies at Brandeis University, agreed. There were strong similarities between the Metcalf stone and sampled of Minoan writing dating back 3,000 years to the Bronze Age civilization which flourished on the Mediterranean island of Crete from 3000 to 1100 BC. Dr. Gordon became the center of another controversy a few years ago when he announced that a sample of Phoenician writing found on a stone in Brazil was authentic after other archaeologists had denounced it as a fraud. After all, it was hardly possible that the ancient Phoenicians could have visited Brazil. Or was it? As for the Bat Creek Stone, Dr. Gordon thinks it might have been the handiwork of Hebrews from Palestine during the Bronze Age. Both scientists speculate that ancient Semitic tribes from the Middle East may have visited North America thousands of years ago. This, of course, revives memories of the lost tribes of Israel. Could they have somehow found their way to this continent and become that, lost American culture described in the Mormon Bible? Dr. Mahan believes that some Indian tribes can be traced back to seafaring Mediterranean peoples. The Uchi, he points out, are racially and linguistically different from other North American tribes. Their legends state, we came as the sun came, and we went as the sun went. Dr. Mahan interprets this to mean that the Yuchi came from the east, across the Atlantic Ocean, and then moved northwards from Florida to Georgia. Some archaeologists tend to lump runestones together with the stones bearing Indian petroglyphs. Petroglyphs are designs carved into rocks as path markers, and thousands have been found all over the Americas. Although innumerable isolated Indian tribes were obviously responsible for them, there are many interesting similarities in the symbols used. 
Some of these same symbols have been found carved on other ancient rocks in other parts of the world, suggesting that this form of writing was universal at one time, even though the races and tribes responsible could not understand each other's languages and in most cases had little or no contact. Archaeologists studiously try to overlook the fact that some of these pictographs can be traced to ancient Mediterranean cultures. But the runic writing is quite distinct from the Indian petroglyphs. The runestones carry alphabetic symbols, while petroglyphs bear picture writing loosely related to the Egyptian hieroglyphs. The Kensington Stone, as translated by Frederick Pohl, describes how eight Goths and 22 Norwegians established a camp. One group went fishing, and when they returned, they found the ten who had remained behind red with blood and dead. The year is given as 1362. Indian petroglyphs, on the other hand, were customarily devoted to trail information, where to find water, and the like. One Indian pictograph of particular interest is a complex design which has been found throughout North, Central, and South America. It depicts a series of squares inside one another. The Hopi Indians call this the Mother Earth symbol. To the Pumas it is the House of Tuu, to the Kunas in Panama it is the Tree of Life. Anthropologist Harold Sterling Gladwin saw something else in it when he studied this symbol carved on the wall of Casa Grande, Arizona. In his book, Men Out of Asia, he noted that the Mother Earth symbol is identical with the Minoan labyrinth depicted on coins from Knossos, Crete. Circa 200 BC the famous labyrinth was said to have been built by Daedalus to hide the half-man, half-bull minotaur. Dr. Gladwin and Dr. Clyde Keeler of Milledgeville, Georgia. Both seem to think that the Indians' use of the ancient labyrinth symbol is evidence of the influence of the early Minoan culture. In the early 1960s Angelos Galanopoulos, a Greek scientist, proposed still another theory for Atlantis. He suggested that sunken Minoan dries of Crete might have supplied the basis for the Atlantis legends. According to his theory, Plato got his dates wrong. Atlantis may have disappeared only a thousand or so years before the historian heard the tale, not nine thousand years before. It may have been one of the Greek islands, possibly Thera. Divers and archaeologists working in the waters there in recent years have uncovered all kinds of evidence indicating that the Minoan culture came to a very abrupt end. So abrupt those craftsmen left their tools next to unfinished works and fled. The explanation currently in vogue is that a sudden volcanic eruption destroyed the islands. Dr. Galanopoulos has been partially successful in matching Plato's description of Atlantis with what is now known about Thera. Dr. Bruce Theheesen, an oceanographer, believes that the eruption occurred around 1400 BC needless to say, other scientists and schools loudly dispute this date. We do know that early Crete was the center of an impressive culture, that great cities and temples were built there, and that it was a major naval power. It is not likely, however, that Crete and Thera could have lived up to Plato's description of the super-civilization of Atlantis. Still we have all the perplexing evidence of the runestones and other artifacts scattered around this continent, which demonstrate those men from Europe and possibly from Crete and Thera did visit America in pre-Columbian times. It is even possible that groups settled here and built forts and temples, the remnants of which have served to augment the beliefs of dozens of cults and fringe societies. In a learned dissertation on petroglyphs published by the Smithsonian in 1937, Julian H. Stewart frowned on the arguments that attempt to prove that Egyptians, Scythians, Chinese, and a host of other Old World peoples, including the Ten Lost Tribes of Israel, invaded America in ancient days. He noted that devotees of the subject have written voluminously, argued bitterly, and even fought duels. Now, over 30 years later the Smithsonian is slowly changing its tune. They have stopped blaming the Indians for all these carved slabs. The Indians have been denying credit all along, of course. When the white men first arrived here, in British Columbia, Canada, in 1860, the West Coast Indians had already incorporated the carvings in their legends, Bill Thornburg, a petroglyph expert in Victoria, Canada, said recently. They showed them to white explorers and explained they were left by an ancient civilization and were the hubs of creation. Thornburg points to what appears to be a carving of a Chinese dragon, known in Indian legend as a Sisute. There does seem to be an oriental background to them, he observes. Being carved in sandstone. 
It's virtually impossible to say what age they are. I found some that were buried under more than a foot of topsoil. Now this wasn't the kind of topsoil that would have washed over them. This was formed there, placing the age of the carving around five to seven thousand years, which is really ancient for this. Country? Thornburg found one petroglyph on Vancouver Island that had a hole worn completely through it by dripping water, proof that it had been there for a very long time. At another site he found a carving which had crumbled when a massive tree grew straight up through it. Petroglyphs which were definitely the work of Indian tribes often tell interesting stories about hunts and battles, and in several instances, encounters with the little people and other phantom inhabitants. Some contain solemn warnings that the valley or mountain ahead is the abode of these sinister phantoms. The Cherokee Indians have legends about the strange entities who resided around Chimney Rock. North Carolina. White people have also seen them occasionally. In 1806 the Reverend George Newton reported to the Raleigh Register a very extraordinary vision of thou sands of beings in the air. They possessed a glittering appearance resembling the human form and were seen on or about Chimney Rock on the 31st of July last. Researcher Angelo Caparello found this testimony by a Mrs. Reeves, one of the alleged witnesses. I looked towards the chimney. I was absolutely amazed, for south of Chimney Rock and floating along the side of the mountain was a huge crowd of white, phantom-like beings. Their clothing, and filmy as it looked, I can only call it clothing, was so brilliant a white it almost hurt my eyes to look at them, although I felt weak, somehow, it left a solemn and pleasing impression on my mind. Chimney Rock is only one of the countless haunted places on this haunted planet. Chapter 4 Towers of Glass and Theories of Putty Vitrify is a $10 word meaning to change into glass. Glass is made by heating sand, silica, and or various oxides of silicon, boron, phosphorus, and other materials, then cooling the result rapidly to prevent crystallization. The process is fairly simple, and men have been manufacturing glass for thousands of years. When the first atomic bomb was exploded in New Mexico in 1945, it not only left a big hole in the ground, but the tremendous heat melted the sand and fused it together in glass-like fragments. These scorched particles were identical to the objects known as tectites. Tectites have been found all over our haunted planet and have baffled science for years. One recent expedition found tectites scattered over an area 6,000 by 4,000 miles from Tasmania to north of the Philippines and from the East Indies to the east coast of Africa. These were analyzed as being approximately 700,000 years old one. Like nature, science abhors a vacuum. So most books on mineralogy blandly assert that tectites are of meteoric origin. It is a nice little theory, and everybody seems to believe it. However, a majority of all meteorites are made out of solid iron, and most are vaporized by the intense heat of friction when they enter our atmosphere. Substances capable of melting into glass wood of course, burn up before they hit the surface of the Earth. In 1969 a group of NASA scientists dished up a delicious new version of the meteorite theory. They announced that tectites were from the Moon. Eons ago, they speculated, a huge meteor plum meted into the Moon, striking with such force that its impact hurled tons of Moon dust into space. This lunar material attained escape velocity and passed into an orbit around the Earth, where it gradually was sucked downwards by gravity, entered the Earth's atmosphere, melted, and fell into the Pacific Ocean. So another mystery was solved. Unless you happen to have an 8th grade education, a slide rule, and a basic knowledge of the mechanics involved. Then one C. Tectites and Geomagnetic Reversals, B. P. Glass and Bruce C. Heason, Scientific American, July 1967. You would find that the impacting meteor would have to be of enormous size and be traveling at fantastic velocity in order to accomplish the first step, casting debris beyond the moon's gravity. Such a meteor would, in all probability, affect the moon in other discernible ways, such as changing its orbit. Next, a long series of spectacular coincidences would be necessary for the debris to enter the proper orbit at the proper time so that it would lapse into a retrograde orbit around the Earth. Finally, since tons of tectites are scattered in paths across the Pacific floor, 
And since we know that less than 5% of a mass entering the Earth's atmosphere is likely to survive and hit the surface, the quantity of lunar material necessary to produce those tektites must have been larger than the original impacting meteor. Hunks of glass have fallen from the sky, however. In fact, since ancient times all kinds of odd junk has been dropping on us, ranging from stone pillars and metal wheels to huge blocks of ice and vast quantities of real blood and even raw meat. Science conveniently ignores everything but the iron lumps which, they presume, are pieces of old planets drifting around in space. To astronomy's credit, we do know that there are groups of this debris in the Earth's orbit around the Sun, and we can predict annual meteor showers which occur as we pass through this mess. One chunk of glass and metal crashed into a driveway in Canifton, Ontario in September 1968. Wesley Reed looked at it and saw that it was too hot to handle. After it cooled, he found he had a brownish object weighing about 12 ounces. When it was tested by experts, they found it was made of glass laced with a small quantity of pure zinc. Whatever it was, it didn't seem to be a part of a man-made satellite, which contained very little glass anyway, and it definitely fell out of the sky. Earth's phantom inhabitants are always dumping their garbage on us. Flying saucer enthusiasts have been collecting and analyzing this junk for years and have found pieces of pure aluminum, magnesium, tin, copper, slag, and endless varieties of silicon. Unfortunately for them, none of this aerial debris seems to support their contention that UFOs are spaceships from another planet. Nor has any known meteorite strewn such materials or tektites in its path. The discovery of tektites and vitrified stones among the ancient ruins of Baalbek has inspired another popular ufological myth, that Baalbek once served as a spaceport for rocket ships from another world. A Soviet ethnologist, Professor M. Agrist, proposed the theory in an article in Moscow's Literature Maya Gazeta in 1959. He also suggested that Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed by an atomic bomb. Lot's wife, he asserted, did not turn into a pillar of salt but was actually reduced to a pile of ashes when she ignored a warning not to linger behind Lot's fleeing party. Baalbek is located in Lebanon, east of Beirut and north of Damascus, Syria. In ancient times it was a thriving city filled with great temples dedicated to Baal, the sun god. The pillars and stone slabs, some weighing many tons, still standing are impressive, but no more impressive than the scores of other similar ruins scattered throughout the Middle East. Enormous ruins of this type can be found deep in the heart of inhospitable deserts, raising once again the question of how the ancient peoples managed to quarry, transport, and erect these monuments with crude tools and a minimum of mechanical aids. Yet, quite obviously, they did manage, and man aged well. In 1948 an expedition from the University of Chicago unearthed the remnants of an ancient village 30 miles east of Kirkuk, Iraq. Dr. Robert J. Braidwood estimated that the village had been settled some 8,000 years ago. Baalbek is, in comparison, a modem city. Professor Agris' theories were a bombshell to the assorted cults, particularly the flying saucer believers. He regarded the presence of tektites as evidence that atomic-powered rockets had once used the vast stone platforms at Baalbek as launching areas. Apparently he did not know that vitrified ruins are a common phenomenon all over the world. Forts and towers so old that there are no legends to account for them can be found throughout northern Europe and the British Isles and the walls of many of these are vitrified. At some point in the distant past these structures must have been subjected to tremendous heat, though not necessarily from the blast of some nuclear-powered rocket. Lightning is the explanation most frequently offered by science. But there is no evidence to indicate that lightning bolts vitrify stone or even sand, although we really know very little about lightning and its effects. It would take dozens of lightning bolts all striking the same spot to produce these vitrified monuments. In some parts of the world, such as an area of 18,000 square yards outside of Cusco, Peru, whole hillsides have been vitrified. Theories of volcanic activity and glacial movements have been offered to account for these, but none of these theories really work. There are legends describing how the planet was once bathed in fire. Maybe more than once. So this vitrification could be the product of some nearly forgotten natural catastrophe. On October 8, 1871, a gigantic fireball or meteor roared over the Midwest, 
causing a rash of disastrous fires in several states, including the famous Chicago Fire. Thousands of people were killed in Illinois and Wisconsin, and vast areas were ravaged by flames that night. A similar fiery visitor from space could have caused the vitrifications. Another strange phenomenon could be to blame. From time to time overpowering waves of heat from an unknown source are concentrated in specific areas. Figueira, Portugal, suffered one of these mysterious blasts of heat for two minutes on July 6, 1949. The temperature soared to 158 degrees. Hundreds of people collapsed in the streets, while thousands of chickens and ducks keeled over dead, and the Monjegu River dried up suddenly in several places, killing countless fish. We don't understand this phenomenon at all, and it is possible those even more intense heat waves of this type have occurred in the past. The followers of Agrist were not about to accept such in vain explanations for the vitrification of Baalbek, however. A young astronomer, Dr. Carl Sagan, presented a paper before the American Rocket Society on November 15, 1962, in which he repeated Professor Agrist's speculations and urged that ancient myths and legends be re-examined for possible clues to an early visit by an extraterrestrial civilization. Other researchers scoured the ancient records of India and found things such as the Mahabharata, a document dating back more than 3,000 years, which describes a blazing missile that hurtled out of the sky into the midst of an attacking army, producing a radiance of smokeless fire which flattened chariots, ignited forests, boiled rivers, and reduced dark clouds of death. A one eye of this sounded uneasily like an atomic attack. In the Mashallah Parva, another ancient historical account, there is a vivid description of some kind of death-dealing ray which began as a small, bright glow, grew into a shaft of brilliant light, and then consumed its target. This phenomenon was accompanied by violent winds, peals of thunder in cloudless skies, and earth tremors. Terrible rakshasas, shaped like huge mounds, attacked another Indian army from the sky and fired weapons winged with gold, thunderbolts, and hundreds of fiery wheels. Even in the Bible we are told how the prophet Elijah was saved by S.C. Mysterious Fires and Lights by Vincent Gaddis for a fully documented description of the 1871 catastrophe. Balls of fire which wiped out a hundred soldiers and their captains, King's Eel. That would have been around 896 BC there are innumerable stories of this type from all cultures indicating that WoW is armed with spectacularly advanced weapons and doesn't hesitate to use them against mortal men. So, one cultist conclusion about the vitrified forts is that they were attacked by flying saucers which focused deadly heat rays on them and their occupants. However, the entire desert between Damascus and Baghdad is littered with blackened rocks. Thousands of square miles seem to be charred, not by the sun but by some long-forgotten holocaust. Did Wow lay waste to Ak of Mesopotamia? Or did some horrible natural disaster wipe out the great civilization that once thrived there? Chapter 5 Strong Men and Stupid Enterprises 4,000 years ago Great Britain was populated by a small group of people barely out of the Stone Age. They had a few primitive tools made of bones, and they probably eked out a living with only the greatest difficulty. Anthropologists estimate that there were probably about 300,000 of them. They were undoubted divided into warring clans and factions, since factionalism is a natural state of man. Yet somehow, thousands of these people managed to get together to spend many generations quarrying huge stones, some weighing 30 tons, in the Presley Mountains of Wales and hauling these enormous blocks 240 miles to Salisbury. There they systematically arranged these stones in a circle, following measurements so precise that they were able to construct a mathematically correct astronomical computer. It's called Stonehenge. Like the Great Pyramid, Stonehenge appears to have been a pointless and impossible exercise. Thousands of workers had to be fed, clothed and housed for generations as they labored on the profitless project. Top-flight administrative talent must have been necessary to plan and organize the work and supervise its execution. Architects had to design the monument. With care before the first block of stone was chipped out of the hillside. Above all, we are asked, by the archaeologists, to believe that these early primitives had the motivation necessary to dedicate themselves to such an awesome task. We are also asked to believe that they pushed and hauled these monstrous stones up and down hills, across rivers, through forests and soupy bogs on sledges and wooden rollers. Then somehow, 
they managed to stand the slabs on end, lifted other stones on top of them, and built the whole thing so securely that it would last for 4,000 years. Plainly, the whole thing is quite absurd. In his definitive book, Stonehenge Decoded, astronomer Gerald S. Hawkins catalogues these absurdities and offers the educated estimate that the construction of Stonehenge required at least 1.5 million man days of physical labor. He calculates that it took three centuries to build. That's ten generations. Ten generations of primitive people who were somehow convinced that it was worthwhile to arrange a pile of giant stones in a circle on an English plain. For generations the work on Salisbury Plain must have absorbed most of the energies, physical, mental, spiritual, and most of the material resources of a whole people, Hawkins observed. There are others, of course, who prefer to believe that the early Britons didn't build Stonehenge at all. To them, it is obviously the work of the Atlanteans or even the wondrous space people. If Stonehenge were the only existing megalithic monument of this type in Britain, Hawkins' work would be more acceptable. Unfortunately, there are several hundred of these stone circles scattered about the British Isles, many of them just as mysterious as Stonehenge. We must therefore assume that all the Stone Age Britons were frantically engaged in monument building for at least a thousand years. If the scientists have dated Stonehenge correctly, then its construction occurred around the same time that the Minoan culture blossomed on distant Crete. The Great Pyramid had already been built or was in the final stages. So far as we can tell, the Indians had not yet appeared in North and South America. On Lewis, the northernmost island of the Outer Hebrides, many hundreds of miles north of Stonehenge, there is another group of giant standing stones arranged in a circle. Called Kalanish, this ring consists of 13 blocks set around a large central stone. It is erected in a desolate, hard-to-reach place again posing the questions, how and why did the early builders put it there? Since Kalanish is somewhat cruder than Stonehenge, Hawkins speculates that perhaps it was built first, and the builders applied what they had learned from that effort to the later construction CM the Salisbury Plain, but the two sites are separated by a vast distance and expanses of water. In order for the theory to work, we need evidence that the early Britons were also great travelers and had a society developed enough so that they could travel in large groups. The small, wandering tribes couldn't meet these criteria. Astronomers and scientists have been measuring and studying these sites for centuries, and the general conclusion is that the stones were arranged in such a way that they deliberately aligned with certain stars and phases of the moon to form a crude computer which acted as a calendar. Hawkins fed his own calculations into a modern electronic computer and produced numerous charts and tables demonstrating such correlations. In essence, when a man stands in the center of the Stonehenge circle, specific stars, or the sun or moon, appear directly over specific stones at specific times of the year in a manner which had to be planned by the builders. Hawkins noted, some 240 Stonehenge alignments translated into celestial declinations. For whatever reasons those Stonehenge builders built as they did, their final, completed creation was a marvel. As intricately aligned as an interlocking series of astronomical observing instruments, which indeed it was, and yet architecturally perfectly simple, in function subtle and elaborate, in appearance stark, imposing, awesome, Stonehenge was a thing of surpassing ingenuity of design, variety of usefulness, and grandeur, in concept and construction an eighth wonder of the ancient world. Considering the enormous amount of effort that must have gone into its construction, Stonehenge ranks as the costliest calendar in the world. Earlier investigators tried to explain Stonehenge as the work of the Romans, the Danes, similar construction stand in Denmark, and the Druids, as esoteric priesthood which entered Britain from France in 500 BC Stonehenge had been around for at least 1000 years when the Druids arrived but nevertheless, Druidism has become closely allied with Stonehenge. Even today, members of the most ancient order of Druids make an annual pilgrimage to the site to perform their rites, rites which they claim date back to the days of Atlantis, incidentally. Hawkins discovered that a significant cycle occurs every 18.6 years at Stonehenge. He calls it midwinter moonrise, for the moon rises over one particular stone every 18.6 years. Then he points out with some glee a statement by the ancient historian Diodorus, circa 50 BC, 
The moon as viewed from this island appears to be but a little distance from the earth and to have on it prominences like those of the earth, which are visible to the eye. The account is also given that the god visits the island every 19 years, the period in which the return of the stars to the same place in the heavens is accomplished. What god visited the British Isles every 19 years? Could Stonehenge have been constructed to predict the appearances of some alien being? This would have given those ancient stonemasons a strong religious motive for constructing it. Whoever planned Stonehenge had to have knowledge of mathematics and astronomy. Did the Stone Age Britons possess such knowledge? Or was the information passed along to them somehow? Were they following orders, just as Moses followed the specifications given to him by Jehovah for the construction of a gold ark? Exodus 25. The gods and demons of all cultures have always had a penchant for ordering men to build huge, seemingly useless temples, tombs, and artifacts. Soon after Gerald Hawkins published a summary of his findings in Nature. October 26, 1963, he became the center of controversy. Mathematicians, astronomers, and archaeologists who had never been near Stonehenge assaulted his thesis and dissected his semantics. He did leave many unanswered questions, largely because they were unanswerable. Twenty miles from Stonehenge there is another ancient wonder the Mammoth Mound at Silvery. This is a man-made mound of earth 130 feet high, covering over five acres. Scientists estimate that it was constructed around 1800 BC, which means that while thou sands of early Britons were starting work on Stonehenge, other hundreds or thousands were pointlessly hauling baskets of dirt to Silbury to build one of the largest mounds on earth. In 1848 a group of investigators burrowed a tunnel into it, going from the top to the bottom in hope of finding some clue. All they discovered were some picks made from red deer antlers. Recently these objects were given the carbon-14 test and were found to be from around 800 BC. This was most upsetting to the theorists who believed the mound was at least a thousand years older than that. At the present time a team of American and British archaeologists are busy digging new holes in the Silbury Mound, searching for new clues. Man-made mounds of unknown origin and purpose number in the thousands all over this haunted planet. In Ireland they are called she, or fairy mounds, and are purportedly the homes of the little people. St. Patrick is supposed to have stood on Crow Patrick, a mound in County Mayo, when he ordered the snakes out of Ireland. Hundreds of these mounds are scattered throughout the United States, where they are popularly called the Indian Mounds, even though the Indians have no legends to account for them. Some of the mounds in Ohio, Minnesota, and in the southwest are skillfully laid out in geometric patterns which can be seen only from the air. When viewed from above, they represent elephants, birds, snakes, and other animals. Whoever laid these things out apparently intended them to be seen from the air. From the ground they appear to be nothing more than symmetrical hills with flat tops. Aerial surveys of South America have revealed elaborate, ridged fields and earthwork, some covering 50,000 acres and some as long as a thousand miles, in at least five scattered locations. The ridged field at Lake Titicaca in the Andes covers 200,000 acres and is spread over 160 miles. These man-made ridges and mounds may have been part of a complex agricultural and irrigation system. One other mounds and ridges of this sort are spread throughout Europe and Asia. Stone chests found in mounds in the Mississippi Valley are identical to chests dug up in mounds in Yorkshire, England. But most of the mounds have yielded little or nothing to patient diggers. Yet the presence of these mounds everywhere is an indication of a worldwide culture in prehistoric times which regarded mound building as an important activity. We do know that mound building persisted as part of the burial rites of ancient peoples. Early historians such as Homer and Herodotus describe these rites. Alexander the Great is supposed to have spent a fortune to erect a huge mound over the grave of his friend Hephaestion. The kinds of ancient Scythia on the Black Sea were buried under mounds. Archaeologists assume that this mound-building practice led eventually to the development of the Egyptian pyramids. The desert sand was a poor mound-making material, so the Egyptians switched to stone blocks. But how did mound-building spread to the Americas in the pre-Indian epoch? Flying saucer cults read great significance into the fact that many modem UFO sightings seem to congregate around the old Indian mounds. Strange lights, bobbing and weaving and blinking in intelligent patterns, 
periodically cavort above the mounds of the Ohio and Mississippi valleys. Since UFOs have a tendency to appear in the same geographical locations year after year, century after century it is possible that ancient people saw them too and erected the mounds for them. Some flying saucer writers have borrowed a page from Professor Agrist Balbeck theory and suggested that the flat-topped mounds were intended as UFO. Airports. If the great mounds were merely monuments to the dead, they were costly ones. Even with modem bulldozers and steam shovels, it would take much time and money to construct a mound 130 feet high and 5 acres square, like the Silbury Mound. It is difficult to visualize tribes of prehistoric people engaging in this activity for months or years. It is even more difficult to think of them planning the mounds so they would present specific symbols when seen from the air. Now, it has been established that while the early Britons were simultaneously erecting Stonehenge and piling dirt for the Silbury Mound, they were also carving giant figures in nearby hillsides. The figure of a great white horse is cut into the summit of a hill in the Berkshire Downs. At Cern Abbas a giant caveman is traced upon a hillside. He carries a club, and his male genitalia are prominently displayed. A similar figure, the long man at Wilmington, was emasculated by early Christians. There are many others spotted from Australia to Africa to the United States, all obviously meant to serve as landmarks for unknown pilots cruising the virgin skies. The tradition for making these landmarks survived until at least 1500 years ago for that is the apparent age of the famous Nazca lines found in the Peruvian desert. Nobody paid much attention to these lines until the early 1940s. Since then they have become an important facet of Atlantean and flying saucer lore. From ground level the Nazca lines are merely a jumble of paths made by brushing aside the stones and pebbles of the desert. There is little rain or natural erosion in the area so the lines have remained intact for at least 700 years and possibly even for 1500, estimates vary. Seen from the air, the clearances form the outlines of spiders, birds, fish, assorted monsters or unknown animals, and numerous squares and rectangles, some longer than two football fields. Dr. Maria Reich, a German astronomer, has lived at Nazca for 20 years, carefully charting all the lines by viewing them atop a high ladder. Daniel Cohen remarked in Science Digest, May 1970, in spite of such devotion to her work, she is regarded by some scientists as a woman obsessed with a theory, rather than a careful scientist. Dr. Reich had produced all sorts of correlations between the lines and the positions of the sun, moon, and stars. She postulates a gigantic desert calendar with which the ancient Peruvians could mark the passing of the years. Her opponents argue that with so many lines and so many astronomical bodies with which to make alignments, it is possible to work up many correlations, but that they are meaningless. The Inca Nazca people who created these lines were massacred in the wars which followed Francisco Pizarro's invasion of Peru in the 1500s. The Inca civilization destroyed by Pizarro apparently came along centuries after the lines were laid out in ancient Inca road slices across the desert, ruthlessly severing the lines. It would seem that the Incas regarded the lines as insignificant. Nevertheless, hundreds of people must have worked for years, if not for generations, in planning these lines and scratching away the topsoil to render them. The Nazca lines remain as another of early man's energetic but seemingly pointless enterprises. On Easter Sunday, 1722, Dutch Admiral Jacob Rogeveen landed on an island in the Pacific some 2200 miles from the coast of South America. The first things he saw were hundreds of giant statues squatting near the water line, staring out to sea. They were huge, eyeless heads mounted on small stone bodies. Some were as high as 36 feet. Admiral Rogeveen had discovered not Atlantis but Easter Island a pitifully barren volcanic island with an area of 45 square miles with almost no trees, and with no wildlife except for hordes of bothersome insects. It was populated by cannibalistic tribes of Polynesian origin who had apparently migrated there centuries before. The current population is 270, but at one time it was considerably larger. Inter-tribal wars and raids by early slave traders whittled the population down. The Yahu statues were quarried from volcanic rock. Some weigh as much as 30 tons. Since what is practically non-existent on the island, 
The statues must have been hauled out of the quarries with ropes and sheer muscle power, dragged down to the beaches and raised upright with more muscle power. Many of the monuments were topped with a hat, or pukau, made out of red rock. Some of these pukaus weighed five tons. How the natives raised these five-ton earrings to the tops of the erected statues is another puzzle. Like the builders of Stonehenge, the Easter Islanders had to AC complies their task with the crudest kind of tools. Each statue must represent months or years of labor. There are over 600 on the island. The statue building came to an abrupt end for some reason. So abrupt that the workers dropped their stone chisels on the spot. Their tools have been found in the quarry, next to 200 unfinished statues, some of which measure 66 feet L degrees in G. Various expeditions have visited Easter Island and tried to piece together the story of the Yahoo builders, but the surviving natives have only the Vegas legends. During the tribal conflicts of the 18th and 19th centuries, many of the statues were overturned and destroyed rather contemptuously. Remnants of the island's culture were erased by the wars, slavers, a smallpox epidemic, and missionaries who ordered the destruction of pagan artifacts. The latter included ancient wooden tables covered with an unknown form of writing. Only a few samples of these tablets remain in scattered museums. Scientists who have concluded that the Easter Islanders are Polynesians blithely overlook the fact that megalithic structures are virtually unknown in Polynesia and that the Polynesians never developed a form of writing. One Easter Island legend stresses that wars were waged between a tribe of long-eared people and a tribe of short ears. The short ears won and presumably ate all the long ears. Perhaps the long ears were the Yahoo builders. Easter Island is so isolated that the early settlers must have been marooned there, and lacking wood. For boat building, remained out of touch with the rest of the world for centuries, while they developed their own peculiar culture. They did have a complicated religion, and it is possible that the statues were some part of it. The red hats could have some meaning, for even the American Indians have legends and prophecies about gods in red hats. But there are also intriguing legends of red-haired beings in such distant and isolated places as Borneo, and the ancient gods of Europe and Asia were often described as having red or blonde hair. Modem Uppo contactees claim that the space people who ride around in flying saucers have long red or blonde hair, too, so it is not surprising that some cultists speculate that members from Wa may have visited Easter Island and that the Ahu statues are tributes to them, each statue symbolizing one appearance of a god. Scores of giant red-haired mummies have been found in a cave 22 miles from Lovelock, Nevada, in the last 60 years. The first ones, discovered in 1912, were between 6.5 and 7 feet tall. Artifacts found in the same cave have been dated by carbon-14 tests. Apparently, the cave had been occupied as far back as 5,000 years. The local Paiute Indians have legends about these giants, describing them as being cannibalistic. In her book, Life Among the Paiutes, 1882, Sarah Winnemucca Hopkins wrote that the last of the red-haired giants were exterminated by the Paiutes in the 19th century. They would dig large holes in our trails at night, Mrs. Hopkins reported. Our people would fall into these holes, that tribe would even eat their own dead. Yes, they would even come and dig up our dead after they were buried and would carry them off and eat them. Atlantis lore also describes giant red-haired cannibals who behaved almost like traditional vampires. Some authors have speculated that the red-haired giants invaded Easter Island from South America, and the cannibalistic rites of the Easter Islanders were inherited from them. There is now an American military base on Easter Island, and recently the workmen and heavy equipment constructing an airfield were diverted to raise one of the flattened statues. It took a heavy crane to do the job that was once done by hundreds of dedicated natives engaged in another of early man's impressive but pointless enterprises. Easter Island has been a favorite of National Geographic for years, and the cultists have bad a field day inventing explanations for the mystery. But there are many other Pacific Islands even more remote and very rarely visited which pose far more baffling questions. The city of Metalanum on the southeastern shore of Ponape Island in Micronesia is now in ruins, but it once could have housed two million people. No one knows who built it or when. Some of the stone blocks in those ruins weigh 15 tons, and the stone used in the city is not from the island. Gigantic waterways or canals intersect the city, 
some of them large enough to float a battleship. Who built this enormous place, and how did they move those huge stone blocks across the Pacific to the island? Whatever happened to the two million residents? 3,000 miles to the southeast of Ponape Island, on tiny Malden Island in the Line Island chain there are the ruins of 40 stone temples whose architecture is identical to that of metal and M. Basalt roads lead from these ruins straight into the Pacific Ocean. The island is uninhabited and covered with guano, bird droppings. But if we draw an imaginary line southwards from Malden for 1200 miles, we arrive at Rarotonga and the Cook Islands. Here another ancient road of basalt blocks rises out of the ocean, innumerable other hard-to-reach islands scattered throughout the Pacific are dotted with enigmatic ruins, canals, and roadways from some long-lost culture. They all seem to be interrelated, as if they were all once part of some great civilization. It would be prohibitively expensive to organize a proper scientific expedition to visit and study all of these far-flung ruins systematically. Besides, their existence doesn't fit in with any of the current anthropological theories. Suppose some scientists should find that they date back 10,000 years or more and are the remnants of some super-civilization of the past? No matter how substantial his evidence might be, he would be immediately crucified by his colleagues and drummed out of all the scientific societies. Obviously, Metal and M was built by cannibals with stone chisels, and those canals served their religious rites to the water gods. Believers in the lost continents of Mew, Pan, and Lemuria, which may have been one place, noisily embrace these tidbits as evidence that a great landmass did exist in the Pacific at one time and that it was populated with a highly advanced race while the Egyptians, Britons, and Cretans were all fashioning stone axes. One cultist tradition, passed along by talkative elemental and members of WoW, is that Lemuria preceded Atlantis. After Lemuria sank into the Pacific, the Atlantis culture got underway and flourished for 14,000 years before it, too, sank 10,500 years ago. A mystical archaeologist named James Churchward is largely responsible for the modern revival of interest in Mew. In the early part of this century he traveled through Central and South America probing into ancient ruins and trying to decipher stone carvings and petroglyphs. Then he published a series of books which combined scientism and silism, that is, he applied the scientific method to dubious fragments of evidence, to support his contention that a supercontinent once existed in the Pacific. In his view, Easter Island served as a kind of factory, and the great stone heads manufactured there were shipped off to other parts of Mew. The poorly investigated ruins of the Pacific Islands and the Great Island Mounds, yes, huge man-made mounds are found on many of these islands, were all a part of that ancient civilization, he said. He leaned on scrambled translations of stone carvings and vague legends of undefined origin. These were mixed in with the flat statements of elementals and strange wise men. Churchward also saw evidence or traces of Mew in the ruins of the Mayan civilization in Central America and the Aztec and Incan cultures further south. He compiled charts which compared the writing of Maya with the hieroglyphs of Egypt, and he constructed the ancient alphabet of Mew. Ultimately, he produced precise maps of Mew and tried to demonstrate how the mysterious ruins found in the United States were linked to that remote continent. Silists everywhere leapt onto his bandwagon, and an enormous body of Mew literature has developed, but science remains unconvinced. See Eklal Kuashana, The Ultimate Frontier. See Lost Continent of Mew, The Sacred Symbols of Mew, Cosmic Forces of Mew. The Children of Mew, Cosmic Forces of Mew, Book 2 all published by Neville Spearman. Actually, there is considerable merit in Churchyard's evidence, even though his conclusions and his bold statements about Mew history can be questioned. A fantastic culture of stone builders and mound builders, predating modem man by centuries or even thousands of years, obviously did exist all over this planet the only possible explanation for the many Pacific ruins, such as the huge stone arch found on the coral atoll of Tonga Tabu two upright columns weighing 70 tons each, topped by a cross piece weighing 25 tons, is that these islands must have somehow been linked together by a land mass in the distant past. The culture of this mysterious land spread throughout the world. Then an unthinkable catastrophe occurred. A catastrophe which altered the face of the whole earth and wiped out everything hot the most durable constructions of that doomed race. In effect the slate was wiped clean. 
the ancient world was destroyed and a new race slowly emerged. But we are still haunted by racial memories of our planet's past. Every race and every culture has preserved, and even guarded, memories of that earlier epoch. Unfortunately, modem science has boxed itself in and dedicated itself to proving Darwin's theory of evolution and other theories which supply a rational, but not necessarily valid, explanation of man's origin and past. This is the end of part two of Our Haunted Planet, a book by John Akeel. Please proceed to part 3, before YouTube deletes it. Be sure to subscribe to our channel for more intriguing details of our existence.